Ladies and gentlemen, the future is not an empty void, passively waiting for events to unfold. It is a masterpiece that we call to design, piece by deliberate piece, vision by thoughtful vision. Therefore, we cordially invite you to join us this afternoon for a Futures Literacy Lab. As such, to guide us into the, this noble endeavor, we are privileged to have among us today an intellectual giant, a visionary whose insights continue to illuminate a path forward. Please join us in welcoming the esteemed scholar, futurist, cultural critic, Professor Zia Adin Zardar. Professor Zardar, a renowned Pakistani British intellectual, has dedicated his career to advancing our understanding of futurology, cultural criticism, and Islamic thought. With a body of work spanning, uh, spanning decades and over 50 influential books, to his name, he has explored topics ranging from the future of Islam to contemporary global challenges. Acclaimed as a leading intellectual, Professor Zardar has been recognized by Prospect magazine among Britain's top 100 thinkers, with the independent loud him as Britain's own Muslim polymath. In conversation with him today, Dr. Qais Hamami, director of ISESCO's Center for Full Sight and Artificial Intelligence, whose guiding purpose as well is strategic foresight. And without further ado, Dr. Qais, Professor Zia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Shukran, shukran, uh, we am. Uh, très ravi uh, de, de rencontrer une, une, um, une, un personnage et un penseur à contre-courant de l'ordre établi à savoir euh, Ziuddin Zardar, que, que j'ai connu depuis 20 ans euh, à l'université à travers Michel Godet, mon directeur de thèse doctorat, où j'ai appris euh, l'étonnant et les aboutissants de la pensée prospective de, de, de Zardar. Une pensée assez avant-gardiste qui est toujours d'actualité aujourd'hui et à travers laquelle j'ai pu travailler sur cette idée, sur les ingrédients de l'attitude prospective dans les différentes cultures. Et à ma grande surprise, l'idée du futur la conscience du temps, le rapport au temps, est très présente dans la culture euh, arabo-musulmane. Je ne vais pas faire une conférence de la prospective, on va tout do donner le, le temps, il sera alloué à notre cher professeur. Moi, une question, euh, Zildin Zardar, une question qui taraude mon esprit depuis toujours, le concept de post-normal, concept que, 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 que tu as mis en place depuis un, un certain moment. Pourriez-vous commencer par avec euh, l'audience qui est ici présente, par partager votre perspective, c'est-à-dire une mise en perspective de ce qui caractérise notre époque actuelle comme post-normal. Euh, post Let me just give three basic examples uh, why we call this period post-normal. Perhaps it's worth mentioning that all epochs in history are quite unique. So for example, if you were living in 1920s, you will think it's a very unique uh, epoch for you. Right? Um, very kind of unusual uh, epoch for you. So why can we, what can we say about the contemporary period, which is say, so different from, from uh, other period? What I want to do is to just give you three, three examples. The first is that first time in history we as human beings have a direct impact on the ecology and geology of the planet. This is unprecedented. This has never happened in history. The, the ge some geologists call this the, the period of the Anthropocene. Right? And climate uh, emergency is one consequence of that. The kind of climate emergency that we face today, we have not faced in history before. So it's quite, in that sense, it's quite unique. A second example I would suggest is what's happening, say, in bioengineering. You can now actually buy uh, online uh, tools that you can hack yourself. But of course, you can use these tools to hack others, others as, as well. Uh, eugenics is making a big comeback in, in the way it has, it, it was not able to do during the first and, 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 and the second world war. Um, uh, IVF babies are becoming more and more common. 
So in a sense, bioengineering is redefining not just the human body, but what it means to be human. This uh, has, uh, has never happened in, in history before. And for the first time, we now have the potential of creating something that has far more intelligence than ourselves. So the kind of artificial intelligence that we see nowadays far, far exceeds the ability, I mean, whether it's intelligent or not, that's a different question, but it ex far, far exceeds the ability of, if you like, intel in intellectual processing that uh, uh, we can now have access to. So Stephen Hawkins, uh, one of the greatest visitors of, uh, of, of recent time, actually regarded artificial intelligence as a serious threat to humanity, in a sense. So just three these, these three examples suggest that we are now facing a period that is quite unusual in, in history. And none of these elements, this level of a superior intelligence, that whole notion of changing the human nature, the uh, you know, bioengineering ourselves, you know, the idea of the Anthropocene, that, that we as human beings have direct impact on the ecology and, and geology of the planet. None of these three ideas, for example, had existed. I can give you lots of other ideas, but it all depends on time. Um, which suggests that we are entering a period which is quite unique in history, at least in the last 2,000 uh, thousand years of history, in, in a sense. At the same time, we can see that whatever we regarded as normal, uh, which essentially was what modernity told us was normal, uh, growth, uh, perpetual growth, uh, uh, you know, for example, the kind of economic system that we have based on consumption and perpetual competition, a great deal of what modernity told us was normal does not hold true anymore. Moreover, much of what we learned in 20, 30 years from postmodernism isn't working either. For example, postmodernism post told us that truth is relative. Now we are actually living the consequence of the notion that there is no such thing as absolute truth, in a sense. So that's what we mean by, by post-normal. I think, in a sense, maybe a little bit of background history may help. Uh, up to uh, uh, 2000, uh, 2004, 2005, 2006, I was edit editor of Futures, which is the primary journal in the field of future studies. And after 13, 14 years of editing Futures, I decided to uh, move on to other things and pass the editorship to, uh, to, to somebody new, somebody younger. Um, so the publishers asked me, um, uh, before I give up my editorship, can I, can I summarize what I have learned in 15, 14, 15 years of editing Futures? Uh, can I publish one last paper in Futures summarizing everything I've learned? So I went back and looked at uh, um, all the papers that we have published, and, and Futures comes out 10 times a year, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big journal. Um, and I looked at not just the, the, the papers we had published, but also the papers we had rejected, and what was the theme. And the overall theme in all these pa papers was that society is becoming more and more complex. That things are becoming more and more interconnected. And when things are more and more complex, they are more and more interconnected, there's a positive feedback loop, and therefore we are almost always on the edge of chaos. That was the kind of summary that I could get out of those, 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 those papers. Uh, and it became obvious after I talked to my other, other colleagues, some of them who are here, that in fact, the, the period we were facing had three basic features complexity, 
chaos, and if you have a situation which is, con which is complex and chaotic, you'll get lots of contradiction. So contradictions became, so the three C's became the kind of the basic foundations of post-normal times. But then we wanted to know what is causing these three C's. What, what is making society more and more complex, uh, more and more chaotic, more and more contradictory? And we identified three things. One is that change is accelerating. So speed is becoming of the essence. That, it's, that uh, almost everything that we encounter moves faster and faster and faster. But at the same time, because of globalization and social media, things have become global. So it's change not just happening faster and faster, but change is almost always global in nature. And thanks to social media, it can reach the individual level as well. So we identify four, uh, three S's as the cons consequences that are producing the, the three C's, complexity, contradictions and chaos. And the three S, S's were speed, scope, and scale. But that wasn't quite satisfactory. And then uh, Menke Boone, the former U uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, pointed out one other thing. He said, it's not just that things are happening faster and faster, that things are global in, in, in scale, and they reach the individual level, but it is also that all this change is happening simultaneously. So simultaneously became, simultaneously became an important part of how we perceive post-normal times. So essentially, if you look at post-normal times, <coughs> what, what we are saying is that four S's, speed, scope, scale, and simultaneity, are producing the three C's, which are complexity, contradiction, and chaos. That's, that's basically what we mean by post-normal times. And we are basically saying that much of what modernity and postmodernism taught us over the last uh, uh, 200 years, if you like, 200 years of modernity and 30 years of postmodernism, does not work anymore. This is what we took as normal. That normal is dissolved in that sense. So now we, we are in a period where, we, where the old paradigms of modernity and postmodernism are dying. New paradigms have not emerged, and therefore sort of we are in this unstable period. It is important to realize that post-normal times is not end period. We're not talking about ap apocalypse. Uh, we are pointing out that we are moving from one system to another system, but the system that we are moving from is, is dying, but the new system has not been born. C'est clair dans le sens où, aujourd'hui, on, on tend post-normaux. Au jour d'aujourd'hui, en post-normaux, l'humanité fait, euh, fait face à un double défi. Elle fait face à un double défi. Tout d'abord, s'accommoder de l'effondrement des paradigmes familiers, tout en essayant de construire des alternatives fiables. Euh, que signifie cette transition pour, no, pour la perception du passé du présent et de l'avenir. So, so we, 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 we have an opportunity, we have a challenge. First, first challenge that we have is how do we cope with the collapsing system? How do we adjust with the, with the, with the, with the collapsing system? And we've seen, we've seen in fact, uh, everywhere, like governance is becoming complex and, 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 and difficult to manage. We're seeing the emergence of far right in Europe, in India, in the United States. Uh, um, we've seen that, that social changes are pretty, pretty profound. For example, uh, 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 I grew up with two or three genders. Now, uh, only uh, last month, uh, Scottish Parliament has passed a, uh, a law which defines 24 genders, right? And some of them I cannot even understand, let alone, you know, uh, uh, mention their name. So society is becoming complex. So, uh, things are becoming complex, the systems are collapsing. So the first challenge is how do we deal with the paradigms that are collapsing, right? And the second is an opportunity because 
not just the paradigms are collapsing, but something has to take their place. So we have an opportunity of creating new paradigms, which are more holistic, more based on synthesis rather than, rather than reduction, more inclusive. So challenges and opportunities at, uh, at the same time. L'idée, euh, Ziodin Zardar, d'imaginer les futurs possibles. Et comme vous le savez très bien, en prospective, on part du principe que les futurs sont pluriels. Ce qu'on appelle le champ des, des possibles. Parmi ces futurs, il y a les futurs souhaitables, réalisables, etc. Mais comment proposez-vous proposez de concilier l'urgence de traiter les crises immédiates, qui sont ce qu'on appelle la, 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 la tyrannie du, du, du présent, avec la nécessité d'envisager des futurs euh, transformateurs à, à long terme, voire à moyen terme. Yeah. 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 Um, so the immediate crisis, we cannot leave. You have to pay attention to the immediate crisis. The system is collapsing, things are changing, you have to pay, you have to pay attention. But if you give all your attention to the immediate crisis, then you are perpetually just firefighting. You are perpetually dealing with the immediate crisis and you get trapped in a cycle. You, you deal with one immediate crisis, and as soon as you kind of, you think you're getting somewhere, there's a second immediate crisis, and the third immediate crisis, and you're trapped in a vicious, vicious cycle. So there's, there have to be some segments of society that pay attention to the immediate, immediate crisis, but then you have to step back, and that's where futures comes in. You have to step back and take a long-term view, right? Uh, because most of the problems that, that we are facing, they're they are complex problems and they require complex approaches. And there's no simple solutions. In some cases, there may not be any solutions at all and you just have to navigate your way out of, out of, the, out of the crisis, in a sense. So the longer view is also very, very important. It's not just, it's not just the immediate, Im immediate, immediate crisis. So what What I would suggest, what we have at the moment, is much of our education, much of our thought, is directed towards solving immediate crisis. We need to move back and introduce thought which looks at crisis, in, uh, which looks at, uh, at futures in long term. There's, there's long term thought, long term planning, right? And a whole segment of society has to be devoted to that. And within that long-range analysis, then you could do something about the immediate uh, as well. But at the same time, you need to concentrate on the immediate. So we, again, simultaneously becomes important. You need to attack the problem simultaneously from different angles, the, the short-term problems as well as the emerging problems in the, in, in the, in the short-term and long-term future, in a sense. So what we need to do is to rethink what education is. So for example, it says there, knowledge is power. Yes and no, because we don't know what knowledge is. So we need some mechanism to understand what exactly is knowledge in, in post-normal times, because knowledge in post-normal times comes wrapped in all sorts of Eurocentrism, all sorts of bias, and very, very, it is very, very important, all types of ignorances, right? So in a sense, we need to appreciate how do we differentiate ignorance from knowledge before we act on knowledge and turn it into power. En temps post-normaux, l'éducation, yeah. en parlant d'éducation, yeah. euh, elle joue un rôle crucial dans la formation d'esprit tournée vers l'avenir. Vous savez très bien l'idée, les premières, les prémices de la prospective, c'était... C'était une idée sur, sur, sur comment on prépare les générations futures. On va très bien aujourd'hui, avant la crise de la Covid, on parlait que 60% des métiers n'existent pas. Aujourd'hui, après crise de Covid, 85% des métiers de demain n'existent pas aujourd'hui. Tout à l'heure, vous avez bien parlé de l'IA et de son impact, etc. Mais quels changements, selon vous, bien entendu, quels changements préconiserez-vous dans les systèmes éducatifs pour cultiver la prospective, ou ce qu'on appelle aujourd'hui l'esprit l'esprit prospectif ou l'attitude prospective. 
bien sûr, dans so, un cadre éthique. Je pense qu'il est important de pointer out que vous ne pouvez pas naviguer post normal times without futures literacy right and here we are talking about futures awareness and futures literacy not as something that is taught to a few people in you know in expertise or what have you in a sense the whole society has to appreciate the importance of futures thinking and the importance of futures literacy so i mean this is a question of awareness if you are not aware that the world is changing and the world is changing in a very specific way that the nature of change itself is changing then you will not be able to do anything about it and to create that awareness you need futures literacy and and i would argue that you need futures literacy right from the kind of kindergarten pri primary school to secondary school to university education all the way through through educational system so we need a f fundamental change Uh, from futures perspective in, in, in education. I mean, at the moment, we prepare students for a society that basically existed in, in history, last 10, 20 years, or we may prepare them if we are really progressive uh, among God and thinking of a society that exists today. But we don't prepare them for the future because the future will not be the same as today. It will be totally totally transformed, that given the rate of change, the accelerating rate of change, the future will be totally transformed. So we have to prepare them for the future, and that's what we don't do. All, all of our students, all of our uh, uh, pupils will actually live in the future. They will not live in the past, they will not live in the present. They will actually grow up and spend 60, 70 years of their life in the future, and we have to prepare them for the future. And the first thing we need to do is to create awareness of the future. And that's where futures literacy comes in. So the first thing I would argue is that we should uh, introduce futures literacy across the board. Right? I mean, that should be one of the tasks of ISESCO, that every Muslim country, by definition, has future studies and future literacy courses right, right throughout. And I would also argue that this is a fundamental requirement in, this, in, in Islam. You know, clearly, one of the first dominant thing within Islamic purview is survival, right? And it is essentially a question of survival. So you are actually teaching your student how to survive the future, right? So I would say that it's just as important as Islamic studies. I mean, I know that, for example, in Pakistan, they start teaching Islamic studies from, from primary school, right? In Malaysia, they start teaching Islamic studies from, but it's, they need to start teaching futures literacy at the same time, right? Because Islamic studies is not going to be any good if there's not much of a future, right? So both things, both things go hand, hand in hand. Euh, euh, L'analyse, elle est très intéressante. Mais, mais nous, parmi euh, le centre de prospective stratégique de l'ISESCO, a été fondé depuis quatre ans. No problem. <laughs> le, centre, le centre de prospective de, de, de l'ISESCO a été fondé depuis, euh, depuis quatre ans dans le cadre de, de la nouvelle vision de l'ISESCO et de son excellence, le directeur général. Euh, on, a beaucoup de, on a donné beaucoup d'importance à l'idée de, de l'éthique de futur. Aujourd'hui, on parle de l'éthique de l'intelligence artificielle, on parle de l'éthique de la technologie, mais on ne parle pas de l'être humain en tant que faiseur de cette nouvelle technologie. Donc, est-ce qu'au jour d'aujourd'hui, selon vous, Ziyoudin Zardar, peut-on parler de l'éthique de futur, de l'éthique de la prospective, pour un avenir meilleur de, de l'humanité um, Absolutely, absolutely. I think it is important to, it is important for me to emphasize that not all foresight is about ethics, right? In fact, a great deal of people who do foresights probably are not really interested in ethics. They're more interested in technology, they're more interested in um, you know, uh, certain aspects of what they think is important for the future. So we need to bring the ethical discussion within foresight in a, in a, in a conscious and, and powerful way. As 
the three examples that I gave of, uh, earlier on, the, the notion of Anthropocene and climate change, it requires ethical uh, transformation. We, we, we need to look at the planet as, you know, it is the terrestrial abode for us. It is the only planet we have. We need to uh, look after it. We need to sustain it. We need to rethink what growth means. These are all, these are all ethical questions, and we need to teach that at the same time as we teach them. You see, a great deal of Islamic studies, in my opinion, focuses on dogma and rituals, but actually doesn't really focus on ethics. And in a sense, futures literacy, Islamic studies should combine together and, and connect and, and make the connection with ethics. In this, you know. uh, dealing with climate change is an ethical question. Dealing with bioengineering is an ethical question. Dealing, what do we do with artificial intelligence? That requires, that requires an ethical question. Now, some of these do not have historical precedences. You are not going to learn a great deal from history. So in many cases, we need to develop a new ethics to deal with these things. And that's the kind of monu monumental challenge that, that, you know, that, that we face, in a sense. Um, yeah, so I, I, I would argue uh, that we need to bring ethics in the discussion of futures and, and uh, foresight and make it the prime focus rather than simply technology or social change, et cetera, et cetera. A great deal of foresight is devoted to technology. I think a great deal of foresight should be devoted to ethics. It's ethics that decides what technology we may or may not need. I mean, not everything that can be done should be done. The question of ought, whether it ought to be done, is also needs to be discussed. And the question of ought is the question of ethics. Donc j'ai avec moi le, le, le livre d'Ibn Khaldun, Al-Muqaddima, euh, Kitab al-Ibar, le livre des enseignements, euh, pour, euh, pas pour le passé, mais pour, euh, pour le futur. Et vous savez très bien, Ibn Khaldun, quand il a essayé de présenter son, son idée du, du, du futur, il a commencé à, à critiquer tout ce qui est approche prédictive, c'est-à-dire tout pour lui, toute prédiction est une imposture, toute prédiction est contre notre culture. Et après, il a développé plusieurs indicateurs, pour anticiper l'apogée et le déclin des États. Moi, j'ai deux questions importantes, Zidine Zardar, par rapport à Ibn Khaldun. Je sais que vous portez un grand intérêt à Ibn Khaldun. La première chose, par rapport au passé, et on reviendra au futur. Ibn Khaldun, dans les premières pages d'Al Muqaddima, l'audace intellectuelle d'Ibn Khaldun, c'est qu'il considère tous les historiens qui l'ont précédé comme de simples chroniqueurs. Parce que l'histoire telle qu'elle a été écrite ne reflète pas la réalité puisque l'historien essayait de se rapprocher du décideur, donc il modifie l'histoire. Et là, c'est extraordinaire. Ibn Khaldun, il parle qu'il faut identifier le probable de l'improbable et le possible de l'impossible dans le passé. Donc comment cette idée que le passé aussi il est pluriel, comme le futur il est pluriel, comment cette idée, est-ce que selon vous, elle est d'une actualité aujourd'hui saisissante Et quelle est selon vous cette idée du futur chez notre grand chef, chef Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Khaldun, le sociologue, le philosophe. Well, that's a very big question. Um, I think the first thing to acknowledge is that Ibn Khaldun was obsessed with the future, right? Because he uh, moved in a period where uh, there's a lot of kind of what he saw as a decline of Muslim societies. And he was very, very concerned, and he really worried about the future generation. So he's very concerned. Uh, but he was also very critical of uh, historians like Tabari, right? Um, because early historians didn't tend to shift things critically. They tended to, be, to accumulate everything. So they will, they will report uh, uh, whatever anecdotes existed in society. And they kind of try to be comprehensive rather than critical. And, and Ibn Khaldun wanted criticism rather than just comprehens comprehensive coverage in, in that sense. So if you look at Tabari's history, it's pretty comprehensive. And almost every anecdote, whether it is valid or not, is in there. In contrast, 
uh, Ibn Khaldun is very, 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 very critical. And I think he also wanted uh, uh, the, 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 the his kind of exploration of the future to be critical as well. So he was not just interested in kind of some sort of fantasy and utopia, but he wanted some sort of realism at the same time. Yeah. The interesting thing is, this is what I find fascinating about Ibn Khaldun. When you read Ibn Khaldun, you expect him to be a Mutazilite, right? Part of the rational school of Islamic thought, but he's not. He's an Asharite, right? He belongs to the theological school, which is very, very surprising. Uh, yet he's very, very critical at the, uh, at the same time. So he accepts, he accepts uh, um, the importance of religious ethics, right? And he insists that that if we are looking at the future, uh, how time moves in cycle, uh, then the future generation should pay more attention to ethics, uh, or religious ethics, than simply to romanticize history or utopian history that, that, that you find in, in, in early historians. Uh, um, for me, one of the, I think, uh, 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 profound insights from classical philosophy comes from Al-Ghazali, who amongst other things, I mean, who spent a lot of time, I mean, most of Muslim philosophers spent a lot of time defining what is knowledge, and we know that there were 500 different categories they came up with, Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Rushd, uh, Ibn Tufel, and so on and so forth. But, but I like the Al-Ghazali's um, kind of distinction. He basically says, okay, there are two types of uh, 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 knowledge, praiseworthy and, and, and unblameworthy, but amongst the praise, praise, praiseworthy, then uh, there are two subdivisions, uh, socially, uh, you know, uh, 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 socially requisite knowledge and individually required knowledge. So we all as individuals need to know how to wash ourselves, how to brush our teeth, when we are ill, how to go to the doctor and so on and so forth. But the socially requisite knowledge is something that society must some, but some members of society must pursue or the whole society will suffer. So if a society doesn't, if a community doesn't have any doctors, then it will suffer. If the community doesn't have any engineers, then they won't be able to build bridges across river and the community wouldn't, need, wouldn't be able to expand and the community will suffer. So I would, I would argue that futures literacy is a socially requisite knowledge as defined by Al-Ghazali, and therefore an essential knowledge for Muslim societies. That's one of the lessons from Islamic history that, that, that we need to take with us. And the other uh, lessons we, we, we take is from Ibn Khaldun, that our future's exploration must be based on criticism and counter-criticism, right? It's not blind, we don't accept every futurist idea that may come from that. I mean, there are lots of uh, foresight consultants will come and sell you any, uh, uh, you know, this and that, right? I mean, I was asked a question, what is the methodology of, of foresight? There's no the methodology of anything. There are methodologies you, you take, you, you, you use the methodology that is useful for the, for the inquiry you're, you're, you're pursuing, right, in that sense. So from, from Ibn Khaldun, we, we have to learn that our future's exploration must be based on criticism, not just criticism, uh, of our ideas coming from arts outside, but also criticism of ideas that we generate ourselves. So it's criticism and self-criticism that, 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 we, that we need to move forward. So the third component in the education that we, I would argue, uh, earlier on I said we need religious studies, but also futures literacy. The third component will be critical thought, right, in a, in a sense because a great deal of conventional Islamic uh, studies based on dogma, acceptance, uh, in fact, it sometimes it even shuns criticism, and we need to bring criticism right at the center of the enterprise. Vous avez parlé, uh, Ziyudin Zardar, d'Al Ghazali. Donc, nous, Abdon Khaldoun, on est passé à Al Ghazali. <laughs> Donc vous avez parlé d'Al-Razeli et, et vous avez essayé de faire le lien aussi, d'expliquer l'idée du temps chez Ibn Khaldun. Mais moi, ma question, et je sais que vous portez un grand intérêt, est-ce que selon vous, 
selon vous, les ingrédients de l'attitude prospective existent dans la culture musulmane ou arabo-musulmane Parce que l'idée du futur, est-ce que, est -ce que cette idée, la conscience du temps, existe dans la culture islamique Est-ce que l'idée du temps, on sait très bien que par exemple, euh, avec le Faylasouf al-Awl al-Kendi, c'était un des premiers à essayer d'imaginer le futur. Avec, vous avez parlé de Ibn Rushd, vous avez parlé de, de Ibn Sina, Hay Ibn Iqdan, Ibn Tufayl. Euh, et ça, c'est des philosophes qui ont, selon vous, est-ce qu'ils ont bâti ou est-ce qu'ils nous ont mis les prémices qu'on appelle aujourd'hui l'attitude face à l'avenir uh, I do. I do. I mean, for example, uh, you take Ibn Tufayl and his life of Hay, right? Yeah. Uh, that's a very future-oriented book. And it's also a very evolution-based book because Hay then emerges from the, from the sea, right? From the slime, right? And then he kind of looks around, he starts thinking, etc., etc. Of course, the purpose of the, uh, the, of the novel is to actually show that you could reach Uh, uh, an understanding of God through through reason and and observation alone. I mean that's the, f yeah. but it's a very future oriented, uh, very future oriented uh, 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 novel, uh, and right from Al Kindi onwards. I mean Al Kindi, one of the first Arab philosophers. Um, there is an awareness uh, of, if you like, future generation. I mean the words were not used. I mean, we used. The future generation term is only 30, 40 years old. But there is an awareness of what are we leaving behind for the people who are going to come after us. You see? Uh, conventionally, when people think of Akhara, they always think of sort of Akhara after death. But the, the, our philosophers argued that, bef that from now to Akhara, there's lots of future that we need to pay attention on. To So the, the notion of the kind of future generation or, or, or what we leave uh, uh, for the coming generation is, is, is there. I mean, uh, the best example is the, is the famous hadith, right? That if you think the world is going to end tomorrow and you have a seed, you plant it, right? So the hadith is telling us two things. First of all, the world is not going to end tomorrow. <laughs> Right? That's a speculation. And second, that you need to plant for tomorrow, right? In a sense, right? Um, or the, the other hadith that, you know, trust in Allah, but tie your camel. The tying your camel is the, is the kind of th the futurist thinking. That's where futurist thinking is involved. Because if you just leave your camel and go into your business and come back after in the near future, the camel may not be there. <laughs> so you have to tie your camel. So, I mean, the, the futurist thought is there. The, 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 our problem has been that we have never looked ever at our, at our uh, uh, sources, our historical sources, the Quran, Sunnah, uh, uh, the Hadith, the, the, the classical philosophers and thinkers. We have never looked at them from futurist perspective. We've always studied them from historic perspective. So you, you get history out of them. You never get the future. future Futures out there. Think of how much futures thinking is involved in the hijra. Right? It's not something that just had Prophet got up one day and said, "Right, I'm going to, you know, take my community and and, and move from Makkah to, to to Medina." It involved, you know, good two three years of planning, of laying down roots, uh, a real route that they that they followed with provisions en route, and the false track that they laid down for the enemy to come, the Quraysh to come and And, 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 and pursue. They started, uh, Muslims started moving in Medina two years before the Prophet himself moved, right down to the planning of leaving Ali in his bed. I mean, imagine how much futures thinking is involved and how much absolute futures planning is involved in, in Hijra. But we don't, we, do, we, 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 we don't see it like that. We just see it all. Then there was migration. <laughs> C'est clair, donc, euh, donc selon vous, les ingrédients existent, mais nous, on peut aller à Isesco, on essaie de travailler, travailler aussi, même sur une approche linguistique de, de, de la prospective. Nous sommes en train de mettre en place le, le, le premier glossaire en langue arabe de la prospective et aussi en intelligence artificielle. Ça nous ramène à, à faire un voyage de, de, de Ibn Khaldun, de Ibn Tufayl, de Averroes, etc., à, à ce qu'on appelle les nouveaux penseurs de l'islam. 
et surtout avec, je pense, avec un philosophe, sociologue, poète, moi j'adore la poésie, euh, en référence à Sefir Khalt qui est ici, qui, qui est aussi à une autre, à une autre excellence, euh, le directeur général aussi qui est un poète, à Mohamed Akbel qui vous parle, je pense Mohamed Akbel euh, qui, 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 a idée, qui avait cette idée très, très puissante, révolutionnaire, comment reconstruire la pensée religieuse en islam yeah, yeah. avec dix conférences. Yeah. Malheureusement pour moi en urdu, donc je n'ai pas compris, j'avais la traduction en français yeah, ou en anglais. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mais selon vous, Mohamed Akbel, il a parlé de la cosmologie de l'émergence que notre ami Suleyman Bachir Diane a qualifié yeah. ce concept de prospective. Prospective, yeah. pas au sens religieux, mais une prospective de penser autrement les choses et d'impacter le monde de demain. Donc que pensez-vous de, de, de l'idée du temps ou de la conscience du temps chez Mohamed Akbel Um, well, Iqbal, was, I, it, to, to my way of thinking, is very much a, a poet of the future, uh, you know. Um, the only book he wrote, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam, is very much how do we reform Islam, how, 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 you know, uh, uh, how do we move, uh, move forward. But, I mean, I, I <laughs> it's probably too early for me to think of Iqbal and uh, think of his any... Ex Uh, any, of, any, any of his poems, but but the idea of tomorrow is is, is always there in in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense. Um, so I I think Iqbal wanted to kind of motivate people um, to action and transform both the present and the future, and so therefore lots of his poetry has this revolutionary element. Uh, it um, but as essentially kind of uh, I, I I mean I think the, the main thing I can say about Muhammad Iqbal is that if you read his poetry in original Urdu it does motivate you to go out and change the world he's totally unsatisfied uh, with the world as it exists right And he doesn't really think very much of the West. So he's very critical of the West. Um, and he wants the Muslims to go back to, uh, to, or go forward to, I mean, this is a very imp important point. So when Iqbal talks of history, he doesn't want us to go back to history. He wants us to go forward to our, our historic ideas in a sense. So, so I think that's a very crucial element in, 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 in his thought. Um, unfortunately, um, people read his poetry, but they don't really get the essence of it, in my opinion. Uh, because if they got the essence of it, they wouldn't be in the mess that, that, that we are in. Right? I mean, if you read Javed Nama or Bangedara, is a Bangedara is a is one of those books that my, we, we, we migrated from Pakistan to England in 1961, and Bangedara was one of the books that my mother took. And in fact, only about a month ago, I was looking at the same book, uh, and, and it's kind of full of poems about how to change, how to trans, trans, transform society, so lots of emphasis on, 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 on tomorrow and how, you know, uh, I, and he's also, uh, 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 if we paid any attention to him, we would be much more environmental, con environmental conscious because he is a very environmental poet as well. He talks about nature all the time, mountains, rivers, how to preserve rivers, significance, and he turns them into powerful met metaphors. Um, it's a, a, I mean, uh, in a way, uh, the, the dilemma of Iqbal is that he's recognized as the poet philosopher of, of Pakistan, of the poet philosopher of the East, of the Islamic world, but not many people actually embrace his message. That's, that's, that's the tragedy, I would say. Mes deux dernières questions, et après on va laisser, on va ouvrir le débat avec, avec la salle. Euh, C'est au 20e... Oui, sorry. <rire> mes, mes deux dernières questions, Ziyudin Zardar, il, je pense que c'est quelqu'un que vous avez connu, il s'appelle Mahdi Manjara. Mahdi Al-Manjara. Euh, qui, qui est marocain, qui depuis les années 90 
Il s'est intéressé depuis un certain moment à la prospective, mais il disait depuis les années 90 qu'un des symptômes du sous-développement, c'est la sous-estimation de l'importance des études stratégiques. Et, et, et Mehdi Manjara a essayé d'organiser en 1981 un colloque à Benimlé sur prospective et développement. Et après, je vais venir à, à la jeunesse. Pensez-vous qu'aujourd'hui, on peut faire, et avec l'UN Future Summit récemment, à New York en septembre, le, 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 le foresight est sorti comme first skills. Donc, pensez-vous aujourd'hui que la prospective peut être un outil de développement social, économique, culturel, euh, important, comme l'a bien dit Mahdi Manjara depuis 1990 Yeah, I, I think Mehdi worked very, very, very hard to promote uh, uh, future thought. Um, perhaps it's not recognized, but he was one of the, the, the prime kind of thinkers of future studies in the 60s and the 70s. I mean, he, he was there at the formation of the World Future, Society, uh, uh, World, World future Studies Federation. Um, um, kind of people like Jim Data and uh, Eleanor Massini, all, all the kind of big names of the, of the, of the federation. He was, he was part, of the, part of the circle. Um, I should also say, I mean, I, I, I met him regularly and became quite friends. Um, uh, and I helped with this Algeria manifesto that he produced. But I should also say that uh, uh, Mehdi al Manjara was quite frustrated Right? He was very frustrated by his Western colleagues because it seemed to him that they did not understand what he was trying to say. And part of what he was trying to say to his Western colleagues is that you are not part of the solutions, but in fact you are part of the problem. Right? And I think that message didn't, did, you know, just didn't get through and he, he, he felt so. He and I became very good friends because I also partly thought that the Western notions and ideas were part of the part of the problem for us. If you're exploring the futures, then essentially uh, we 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 don't want to be in a in a position where the future is also colonized, just as our past was past was colonized in a sense. Um, and yes, I agree with with that uh, with with what he was trying to do, and I certainly believe that that. Uh, a great deal of futures thought is very important for shaping social and cultural ideas, right? Uh, but not all futures thought, <laughs> right? Uh, here, crit critical futures is very, very important in a sense because a great deal of futures thought is actually colonizing our futures as well, and we have to be very, very aware of that, right? Um, yeah. So yes, we we want. We want futures thought, we want to engage with it, we want to be inclusive, uh, but we don't want to become an appendage to Western futures uh, uh, fantasies and utopias. Ma dernière question, c'est, elle tourne autour des générations futures aussi, et de l'homme de demain avec grand H, homme et femme. Je pense que vous connaissez Gaston Berger et Gaston Berger. Ses premières idées, c'était comment garantir un avenir, un avenir meilleur pour les générations futures. Et depuis les années 50, il disait que nous sommes en train d'enseigner à nos étudiants avec des techniques et des méthodes qui datent de 20 ans. Et l'étudiant, il va être en exercice dans 20 ans, donc il aura un retard de, de 40 ans. Ma première question, quel est le rôle des, jeunes, des futures générations en temps post-normaux Ma deuxième question, et je finis avec ça, euh, nous, on travaille beaucoup sur l'idée comment euh, teach the future for young people, apprendre le futur aux jeunes. Est-ce que selon vous, au jour d'aujourd'hui, il est nécessaire d'introduire de, des enseignements du futur dès le jeune âge pour, pour accompagner les jeunes aux défis de demain Vous savez très bien, un des conflits, les conflits majeurs aujourd'hui, les conflits, ce qu'on appelle les conflits intergénérationnels, c'est une perception de temps différente entre les seniors et la nouvelle génération. Alors que le temps leur appartient, le futur leur appartient, mais c'est nous, les seniors, que, que nous sommes en train de construire euh, leur, euh, leur futur. Yeah, uh, I think the, the, the future generations will be quite different from, from, from us, right? Um, they will have different resources, different kind of technologies. I mean, you can actually see that with, with, with young children, 
I mean, I was, I was at, a, at, a, at, a, at my son's wedding three weeks ago, and we had all the family, the, all the elderly were there, and none of them, for example, could, could, could get their Wi-Fi or sort their phones out. And these five or six-year-old were running around fixing everybody's phone, right? So if you grow up at that level with that kind of attach, attachment to technology, uh, you're going to, when you mature, you'll, 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 you'll be totally different from, 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 from us in the sense. But they will also face different problems. Right? I mean, as uh, it was said in the introduction, the one thing we can say for sure uh, about the future, that it's going to be, un there's going to be a great deal of uncertainty. And I will also add, there will be a great deal of ignorance. And because uncertainty often goes with ignorance in that sense. Uh, and so the future generation will have to learn both to embrace complexity and deal with an, uh, uncertainty and to differentiate knowledge from ignorance because both will fuse, knowledge and ignorance will fuse. So already we, for example, have a new discipline of ignorance studies which has only emerged in 10 years, agnotology. Uh, um, many universities will be teaching ignorance studies in the next 10 years. If, if they won't, if they're not going to be teaching it, then they, they will produce students who will not be able to distinguish between, between knowledge and ignorance in a, in a sense, yes. Um, but I will also go back to my earlier point that if we are going to teach people Islamic studies from the age of, you know, seven or eight, then we need to teach them futures literacy from the age of seven or eight, and we need to start teaching them critical thought from that, of what is criticism or how you look at things critically from that age as well which means a fundamental shift in, in, in primary and sec secondary education, which then, of course, will lead to a shift in, in higher education as well. Merci, Zéudine Zardar. Pour, uh, je sais, nous, nous, notre, notre format, c'est on ne dépasse pas une heure pour laisser à la salle... Uh, euh, le temps de, de, de poser des, des questions autour de l'idée euh, du futur, c'est la tradition qu'on est en train de faire dans le cadre des, des entretiens du futur. Donc c'est à vous la parole. Saad Safir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sardar. Thank you, Dr. Kess, for this great uh, interview. I've got to one question, actually, very quickly. Uh, does this concept, post-normal times, does it embody the progressive nature of um, of the history, I mean, talking again about uh, a progressive mechanism of history, or on the contrary, does it mean that there is clear cut boundaries between past and these post normal times? Thank you. Um, uh, I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's one of those one of those complex questions. Uh, many of the things that we are facing in post-normal times do not have historical precedents, right? Therefore, um, uh, we are not going to get direct answers from history in a, in, in, a, in 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 that sense. However, uh, as I said, quite a few of these uh, issues have ethical dimension. And of course, we, ethics has a long history in Islamic thought. And I mean, it's, it's very interesting. For example, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm emphasizing knowledge and ignorance because ignorance is becoming a big thing. Uh, ignorance has been studied a hell of a lot. I mean, if you look at Al Ghazali's book of knowledge, he's not just talking about knowledge, he's telling you what is ignorance at the same time, in a sense. So yes, in, if we, we, we will find quite a lot that we can learn from our history. But at the same time, we should be aware that many of the problems we are facing do not have a precedent in history. You know, like the idea of Anthropocene, or, or, or redefining what it means to be human, right? Or having an intelligence that is far, far greater than the intelligence that we can possibly, you know, uh, 
uh, produce ourselves, or having you know multiple genders. Right. I mean, there's no there's no Islamic uh, 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 precedence for discussing 24 genders, <laughs> right? Um, so, but the idea of 24 genders also has a notion of ethics in it. So we can bring over ethics to actually study. So, yeah, so yes and no. Thank you very much, Professor Ziauddin. Uh, Professor, two, two questions. One, first of all, you mentioned that you know the time has uh, sped up. Time is an absolute value, and it can't really speed up on its own. It's up, and Cass also talked about perception of time. Uh, I was reading some studies the other day which says very clearly that people in my age group, not in Cass's age group, but my age group, because we are not generating new memories every day, so our day-to-day, -day, uh, every day merges in, 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 in itself. And the uh, younger people are generating new memories, so de their day and their time perception is not that fast. So is it really true that time is w w fast for the younger generation also, or is it only true for our generation? Second question uh, is sort of an ethics question also. Have we, uh, humanity, has it not really learned from all its past mistakes? We introduced feral camels and feral cats and uh, feral rabbits in Australia, which destroyed the biodiversity over there completely. And uh, the large fauna is wiped out from Australia completely. But now we are talking about, you know, using what you mentioned, bioengineering, uh, the pitfalls of bioengineering. We are talking about bringing back the woolly mammoth is it really ethical, and is, are we not really using foresight into what sort of a chaos we will cause in our biodiversity if we bring back extinct uh, animals and everything? Thank you. Actually, uh, absolutely. Let me take the, se the, 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 the second question first. Um, yes, uh, this is where ethics come in. This is where morality comes in. Therefore, we cannot allow uh, uh, s technology and most of it is Western technology, let, let's be honest, to lead us by the nose. We have to step back and say, yes, we don't want that. I mean, things are changing, but there are certain things we do not want to change, right? Uh, because they shape our identity, they shape our tradition, they shape who we are, right? Uh, and therefore, uh, it is essential for us to step, ba step back a little bit and say, hang on, no, we don't particularly want this uh, to go this route. Uh, we would like to go another route, thank you very much. And that's where ethics and, 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 and uh, morality comes in, uh, in a sense. Uh, your first question, I totally agree. I can't tell one day, one day from another day, right? If you asked me the Iqbal question yesterday, I would have quoted three poems by heart. But this morning, I can't remember a single one, <laughs> right? Uh, so time for me has a different meaning than it may have uh, for, for, for younger people. But what's actually happening is that much of the past present is unfolding, being unfolded by the future. The future is coming, coming rapidly and transforming the present. Uh, one of the reasons we developed the, post, uh, the idea of post-normal times was that me and Jody, who's sitting right there, we got together and we said, why is it that a great deal of forecasts and predict predictions are not working. Why is that the Bank of England cannot even get its predictions for three months right? Forget about three years, they can, you know, pers consistently. Why is that the polling data doesn't seem to work anymore? Right? And the conclusion we reached was that, that much of the uh, foresight methodologies assume that the present is static. But the present itself is rapidly changing. And you have to incorporate the changes within any kind of foresight work you do. And you have, you have to think of the present as a dynamics. It's not a, it's not a static thing. And that's where the post-normal comes in, in that sense. Uh, so yes, time, in a sense, time is, is uh, we need to now look at times in a, in a different way rather than the conventional, purely linear way.
Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating conversation. Zia, I wonder if, if you could talk a little bit about uh, the, the practical side of uh, futures literacy and learning and just two dimensions of it. One is what you were mentioning about young people uh, and education, but the other is also about lifelong learning and how do we begin to introduce uh, these kinds of concepts and ideas uh, into governments and civil service and into companies, et cetera. And just a little bit of your experience, uh, I think, working with those efforts to introduce it, and, and let me just uh, extend it by saying, I think that, that at least if I'm hearing you correctly, there's a part of this is that's about practice. In other words, in post-normal times, we don't just learn knowledge by book learning, mm -hmm. but by learning by doing. And I think that the, the question of art, uh, the question of literature, um, how those aspects of learning are actually crucial for futures literacy in post-normal times. Uh, yes, I I p in a sense, that's a, I suspect it's a very, very, very tall, uh, very tall order. Um, so when I was uh, arguing that we need futures li literacy throughout society, uh, I actually meant that we need to kind of teach the bureaucrats <laughs> a bit of futures literacy as well and teach the corporate people a you know, in, in a sense. So it has to be a society-wide wide, 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 wide thing. It, uh, but the, the, the emphasis I was giving to secondary primary education is that if we start there, then we will create a kind of a, 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 a group in society that will grow up with futures literacy, futures consciousness uh, within them. But uh, I, I would suggest that, uh, especially in post-normal times, if you want to change policy, if you want to transform futures thought into action, you do need uh, to, to communicate <laughs> with bureaucrats, with business people, with corporations, uh, with civil societies, with uh, organizations, and, 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 and so on and so forth. Uh, we've done some work in Malaysia on, in this regard. So the current Malaysian um, policy framework is based both, both on futures and on post-normal times, where we looked at <coughs> how, um, how Malaysia can get, can kind of meet some of the uh, crisis that is face that is facing at this moment. Uh, what it means in terms of in terms of much longer uh, futures, um, and in fact, uh, uh, much of the work we did um, has been incorporated as a kind of a national policy. Uh, so we can we we can actually transform. Um, uh, segments of society by, by introducing. I mean, I would, I would argue that we haven't had a complete success. It's in the, the, the bureaucratic pushback has been in, 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 in incredible, and the political pushback has been in, incredible as well. Uh, but um, if there's a political will, then you can do a great deal in that sense. So at the part of the problem is to create a political will as well. I think it, this is the SESCO's job, mm. in a sense, isn't it, to create a to, to persuade Muslim countries that you need uh, futures consciousness throughout society. Ce qu'on qu essaie de faire ici à l'ISESCO, uh, et dans le cadre de la nouvelle vision de l'ISESCO, donc on essaie de, de, de travailler sur l'idée de la prospective avec les États membres, mais d'une façon globale. Donc on, fait du, uh, on part du principe que les facteurs, les capacités d'anticipation très chères à Riel, elles sont locales, mais on travaille aussi à l'échelle globale et on essaie de construire des visions partagées et des publications communes. Dr. Schiff. Professor, <coughs> it's really very really nice to have this, the intervention and to know that the, there is something called the post-normal times. And I would say that uh, uh, Dr. Cass would have also told us that you are the, the inventor of this concept. Um, as a student of the science, when I see the title of the post-normal times, so it comes to my mind as, the pro as uh, Ambassador Khaled mentioned or asked that is there the progressive, uh, the boundary, or can we say that the normal time is like uh, until the 80s, this much, or after 90s, 
is the post-normal time. And also there, there comes another question in my mind that uh, was there some the pre-normal or the abnormal time? As a student, it's a fundamental, uh, the question which, which is coming to my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know before, uh, before today's lecture, that there is uh, some post-normal times theory, as there is a post-normal science theory. Yeah. Um, and uh, your, your, your writings, what, what I just, uh, going through the Wikipedia and I was reading during your lecture, see that, that your post-normal theory or post-normal time it, it has the characteristics of the speed, scale, scope, and the simultaneity. My question is, or it arises in my mind, that weren't these characteristics before the post-normal time somewhere? And also, I have gone through that there are some critics about your theory who describes that this is not applicable in subcontinent India or this theory is more relevant to the West. How, how to respond, how would you respond, please? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yep. Um, okay, yep, uh, the, the question of uh, normal, um, uh, it, it, it arises all, all, all the time. So that when you talk about post-normal time, the first thing people say, well, when was the normal, uh, well, or, or when did the normal end? Now here, uh, what we mean by normal is what modernity thought us as normal, right? So essentially, we are talking about a period which says modernity is finished, postmodernism is dead, right? What comes after it? But what comes after it is not clear because these are, uh, the, the paradigms of modernity are dying, but, but the new what comes after has not emerged. So that's, 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 that's the in bit. So here, normal, is defined as modern and postmodern period. If you wanted to pinpoint the exact time, we tried to do that, and we came to the conclusion that perhaps post-normal begins when to Google became a verb, right? Which is like 2005, uh, Jody? 2005, right? In that sense, that's when. It now. Uh, to your last question, the four S's have existed uh, before. The answer is no, they haven't. Uh, the speed is very specific. The, the rate of change, accelerating change, is a phenomena for the last 20 years, right? Uh, it did not exist in, it didn't even exist in 1980s or 1990s, or even much of 2000, right? Globalization, we know, began in the 70s, 80s, which introduced the whole, you know, things became global in a sense. And it's social media which took uh, everything to an individual level. So it is the first time in history you can tweet, send a tweet, communicate with one million, two million people instantly, but here's the big thing, they can reply back to you instantly as well. This has never happened in history, right? So there are things that have never happened in history which makes it post-normal. If they have happened in history, then it wouldn't be post-normal. And also there is a such, such a thing as post-normal science and that's, that discourse has existed much longer than the post-normal times discourse. That discourse goes back to the 1980s. Madam, Alizy. Uh, first of all, thank you for the spiritual uh, talk. It was uh, very, very meaningful uh, to listen to it and enlightening. I have two comments. One is a question, and uh, the second one is uh, just a sharing of insight. Um, I think that the future literacy is a paradigm of conflict resolution. I did my MA in conflict resolution, and I never heard about future literacy, and I would love to hear you relate to that because I think it's really interesting. The second comment uh, relates to the stating from uh, Ibn al-Mukafa, because it was uh, echoed in my mind uh, while I was listening to you. Uh, Whoever embarks on a journey without a defined destination is bound to lose his ways. And I was thinking that most of my, the most beautiful things I discovered in my life happened when I got lost and I had to find myself somehow. And maybe this uh, new uh, post-modern uh, or post uh, post-normal time, as you call it, needs our ability to shut off the brain a little bit and maybe 
start to feel with the intuition, because if we need to capture those uh, three C's you mentioned, complexity, chaos, contradi contradictions, maybe this is not gonna do it anymore alone. Uh, maybe it sounds a bit weird, but uh, I feel that intuition has a better role in uh, this new, new phase we are going to. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for, for, for making the point uh, as well, yes. Um, we need everything, right? If you, as I keep saying, uh, if you have a complex problem, and or most of our problems are complex in post-normal times, you need, complex you need complex approaches. And complex approaches cannot be reductive. You cannot rely on one thing. So yes, you need reason, but you also need intuition, you need some notion of where the destination is, but you also need to get lost a little bit, right? Uh, you need some reduction, but you also need a great deal of synthesis. So methodologies that bring things together, you need lots of diversity and different perspectives because monolithic uh, uh, approaches would, would not do. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, uh, um, uh, I agree with you. So more as much diversity as we can handle. Is, uh, are needed. It's called the law of requisite variety. You need as much diversity, as much uh, in methodologies, in approaches, in, in ways of doing. So you can't just say we need science, then art, art has no relevance. In fact, art is just as important as, uh, uh, as science in, in kind of for us to navigate the, the complexity of, of, of post-normal times and maybe learn to embrace uncertainty in, 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 in some, in some ma manners. Um, future literacy or future studies has been used to, uh, to um, um, help with conflict re 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 resolution. Um, we, we have in fact done workshop where people come in from different perspective, hostile to each other, but leave at the end appreciating that if they, if they want to shape a viable future, they need to be, they need to put some of their hostilities aside and come together in a uh, inclusive way so so yes uh, but the fact that you never came across futures literacy while doing conflict resolution is a very good indication of where we are and we are not we should not be there right uh, so hopefully within the next four or five years there be much more futures awareness in conflict resolution circles but also uh, uh, in many other disciplines, um, because some disciplines are so kind of focused on the present that they lose sight of all the hurdles and the challenges and the opportunities that may come in the future. So they need to be opened up uh, to futures consciousness and futures awareness as well. Peut-être deux dernières questions derrière, monsieur, et après j'arrive. Hi, uh, all the way from the back. Right. Um, earlier you mentioned um, this balance between uh, dealing with immediate crisis uh, versus seeking viable alternatives, and for some they might see it as a, as a trade-off. So in systems where the primary incentives and rewards are heavily in line with uh, exploitation, such as uh, uh, seeking uh, or maximizing short-term gains. What strategies or interventions would you recommend to encourage uh, and legitimize uh, exploration behaviors? Uh, specifically, how can leaders today design structures that balance the need for immediate performance with the pursuit of long-term innovation and adaptability? So how can we create this safe space of experimentation, so to speak, without risking the trust or confidence of the stakeholders that we have? Uh, who value predictability and efficiency. Thank you. Well, I think one of the first things we need to, 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 to teach is an awareness that predictability is going to go out of the window. Uh, if, you are, if you are facing complex uh, systems which emphasize uncertainty, then you cannot predict in an old-fashioned way. Uh, and the second is you need to show, uh, uh, you need to promote awareness that short-term goals often bring long-term serious consequences. Uh, it is the short-term goals of growth that has led to climate uh, 
emergency that we now, uh, we now face, in a sense. Uh, so somehow we need to get all the stakeholders, all the corporate guys away from these short-term goals and say, look, there are serious benefits in thinking long-term. Um, and to some extent, this is, you know, this is happening. I think quite a lot of corporations, small corporations, do, uh, uh, do uh, have departments where, in fact, they emphasize you know, long-term projects and long-term uh, 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 long goals. But at the end of the day, the short-termism has to be abandoned. There's no two ways about it. A short-term uh, has to be abandoned. But, uh, but at the same time, crisis that you face you know, today have to be so, uh, have to be negotiated and solved as well. So it's you know you have to ap approach things simultaneously. That's p that's that's the post-normal game, if you like. Last question. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, the power of foresight and post-normal science is a very interesting topic, one that shows how far the human race has gone. But the question is, you said that one of the three S's is speed, which makes you think, uh, if speed if, is one of the biggest factors of change, has there ever been a normal time? And uh, if so, how long do you think they last? And do they even exist to begin with? And that's the question, and thank you for it. Um, uh, you see, it, it, it doesn't really matter whether normal time existed or not existed in the, in, 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 in in the past, the important thing is that the time that we are facing now has certain special features, and we need to appreciate those features. You know, um, and these features are that that, that change is uh, happening at a very you know accelerated pace. The change tends to be glo global. That change impacts individuals, and often changes occur simultaneously. And as a result of that, we, we, we have a society, we have a globe, we have a, uh, systems which are complex, uh, full of internal contradictions, and therefore uh, often reach the edge of chaos. Right? That's, 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 that's the essence of the time that we are in. So the post normal times is both a description of where we are at this moment, and also a theory of how we navigate this change. And we haven't actually gone into the theory of how we navigate, because that requires another uh, discussion altogether. But at the moment, the emphasis is on the description. This is, this is the description of where we are at this moment in time. And as far as I'm concerned, I think it is very important for us to be aware of this, yeah, because that means that the future is not what it used to be. Uh, that more and more uncertainty will come our way. Uh, things will become more and more complex. Um, and all of these will generate their own problems that we'll have to, with you as a young person will have to address in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Zarda. Thank you, Dr. Qais. Uh, our deepest gratitude for Professor Zarda for honoring us today. And uh, we think uh, a round of applause is in order for Dr. Zarda for honoring us here today. And uh, as we conclude this remarkable session, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude once again for uh, Professor Zarda and Dr. Qais for their invaluable insights and thought-provoking perspective. Today's discussions has illuminated the transformative uh, power of foresight and underscored the vital role in navigating complexities of tomorrow. And uh, once again, you are all welcome to join us in the Futures Literacy Lab that it is uh, taking place this afternoon, well, in about an hour. So uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, and we call, uh, call upon everyone to join us for a group picture. Thank you. <laughs>